Hello, and we're back for part three of my series exploring the book The Organism by Kurt Goldstein. And so today we're going to talk about uh, the chapter exploring the points of difference between Goldstein and the Gestalt psychologists. So that's chapter eight that we're going to talk about today. So then the next and final video in this series will be covering chapters nine and eleven. Uh, which will be, I think, very philosophical, uh, especially compared to these other ones, and uh, both of those chapters are pretty brief. Um, meanwhile, today's chapter, there's a lot uh, to cover, so I'm going to try to go through it fairly quickly. Um, got about 21 slides I'm going to get through, so there's, there's quite a lot to today. And I know that a lot of people aren't really familiar with Gestalt psychology, but this is actually going to be a very important chapter uh, to kind of familiarize yourself with uh, in order to really understand Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, especially his book, The Structure of Behavior. It is very much in dialogue with uh, Kurt Goldstein and his critique of the Gestalt psychologists. Um, so if you really are a fan of Merleau-Ponty and you want to understand his book, The Structure of Behavior, which really is a foundation for all of his, his work, um, written work, I would definitely encourage you to familiarize yourself a bit with the context of uh, Gestalt theory and Kurt Goldstein. All right, we're going to dive right in. Um, so at different points in this chapter, he does say that his view agrees in many respects with Gestalt psychology. Um, he himself was not a Gestalt psychologist, but he uh, founded a clinic for brain injured soldiers, um, and he worked close with, closely with the Gestalt psychologist Adamar Gelb, um, and, and he just worked very, very closely with the Gestalt psychologists, um, their school. Um, he was very, very familiar with, with them, so he does know what he's talking about. Um, much more than I do. I'm going to do my best, especially this chapter. Parts of it go over my head and I'm just going to do my best to like connect you with the text to the best of my ability. And maybe you can go and do your own uh, research and, and uh, I can learn from others. Uh, but, but yeah, hopefully this can be just a launching pad for you and your own studies. Um, I'm no authority. Just think of me as a friend who's studying this text with you, helping to uh, contribute what I what I do know about it, what I do know about Gestalt theory. Um, <clears throat> all right, so so we'll get into it. He says, in an attempt to uh, obtain biological knowledge, we must start from the facts that obtrude on us and must try to understand them. <clears throat> in doing so, many things that we have learned from Gestalt psychology will be useful to us. Yet my guiding principle has been a different one, inasmuch as the whole. Uh, the gestalt has always meant to me the whole organism and not the phenomena in one field or merely the introspective experiences, which in gestalt psychology play quite an important part. So this is just in summary, a very good overview of the key difference between Kurt Goldstein, the reason he wanted to write this book. It's the theme that I will hit you over the head with time and time again in this video series. He wants to look at an organism as a whole. And while that is very much what the Gestalt principle is all about, um, the whole, the whole that is more than the sum of its parts, that we need to pay attention to a thing as a whole. That's exactly what Kurt Goldstein wants to do. He is just uh, saying that that has not, that principle has not been applied in all the ways that it needs to, especially when it comes to the human person as a whole organism. All right, so this is a continuation of some terminology that I used in part two of this video series, the last video we did uh, on chapter seven. Uh, he discusses uh, preferred events uh, or preferred behavior. And so uh, I'll just read the quote, but he says, that is very comparable to the idea of a good gestalt or good gestalts. All right. So he says, first, Gestalt psychology is primarily and mainly based on phenomenally given experiences and seeks to determine the Gestalts that appear in those and the laws which govern them. 
he says, second, Gestalt psychology points to certain objective factors of Gestalt formation, such as Werthmer originally formulated with his terms, factor of nearness, homogeneity, simplicity, symmetry, closure, and so on. <clears throat> so he's saying here, I'll just kind of pause to explain. He's saying here that the Gestalt psychologists became very concerned with um, this goal of like objective factors of laws, of kind of given laws, this kind of idea that out there is something very objective um, and it's it's far from subjective it, it's far from examining like what's the inner field of the organism it's it's m very much concerned with like the outer field that influences the organism that perceives something um, so I'll talk about this a bit later on in this video but he says we need to pay attention to the inner field as well as outer field and those are connected and into one big field um, but he, he critiques the Gestaltists for not being as attuned to the existence of an inner field in the organism as a whole. All right, so just going to continue reading this quote. What we are striving for is to grasp not merely the actual givenness of Gestalt phenomena, but their corresponding objective stimulational factors. What will turn out to be a Gestalt for an organism depends predominantly on the organism structure. To be sure the structure of the world is not indifferent to it. So this word structure, think about that when you read Merleau-Ponty's book, The Structure of Behavior. I think that this chapter is very important to Merleau-Ponty. Um, okay, so, so that's just kind of basically what I just said. He wants to pay attention to the structure uh, within an organism, not just uh, the structure of the environment around it. All right, so he discusses the term preferred behavior, uh, which he compares to the good gestalt. He says preferred behavior, good gestalt, or whatever one chooses to call it, represents a very definite form of coming to terms of the organism with the world, that form, that form in which the organism actualizes itself according to its nature in the best way. So I think that's a very big, important quote to to know for this chapter to kind of um, learn from him what his message is for this chapter um, that preferred behavior uh, which he said in the last chapter chapter seven is kind of the um, the constant uh, the pattern of an organism or of a species that we can see these patterns of preferred behavior, which they work towards, which they, and that is what self-actualization is, is being able to complete a preferred performance, a preferred action uh, to fulfill that gestalt, to fulfill the gestalt cycle. Um, and, and he puts it in these words of coming to terms with the world. That's something that he, he says at different times in this book. And he says, according to its nature. So he wants to pay attention to the nature of a thing. Okay. Uh, so he continues with this quote, the second bullet point. With this view in mind, we can do more than simply state that good gestalten are directly given experiences. So it's more than just given. He says, tendency toward preferred behavior means self-organization of the system in the sense that the tension equalizes itself toward the adequate mean that alone makes possible such phenomena as the constancy of the thresholds of the performances, constancy and stability of the world. Thus, the recognition of the essential nature of an organism is prerequisite for proper evaluation of what is a good gestalt. So he says a good gestalt, which is this term used by the gestaltists, it's as much determined, uh, what makes it a good gestalt is as much determined by the outside environment, by those objective laws that the Gestaltists were concerned with as the essential nature of the organism, of that organism's structure. Um, we need to evaluate that when we're evaluating what makes a good Gestalt. There is self-organization of the system, self-organization within the organism that we need to pay attention to. Um, and so he uses the word stability there. Um, and so he talks uh, in this slide in a very philosophical way. It's almost like just a side note of his exploration of what makes a thing real. And I think it's a very, very interesting quote. Um, 
but yes, uh, stability and realness, this is coming up because um, the organism is striving for uh, stability. Uh, stability and real form adequacy are not to be explained by self-organization in a part of the system, but by an adequate reaction of the whole organism. One may put it in other words, stability and real form are to be explained by self-organization of a field, in this case of that field that is the whole organism in a given situation. Stability would then be the expression of the fact that something is experienced by us as real. Reality means that something, fe something features in the adequate stimulus, stimulus reaction of the whole organism. Sorry, there was a typo there, it should say something. Uh, something features in the adequate stimulus reaction of the whole organism that such a form of reaction prevails that makes ordered behavior possible, and with it the realization of the essential nature of the organism. In other words, a thing is not real because of its stability, rather it is stable because of its reality. <clears throat> so basically, um, I think he's saying here that the ability of an organism for its essential nature uh, to kind of be uh, realized in order to be safe, um, that is connected to how we perceive something as real. Um, he says real form is adequacy. And so it, he says it is explained by an adequate reaction of the whole organism. So I'm just going to kind of read through this one more time. It, it's kind of dense. <clears throat> so stability is explained by self-organization of a field, the whole organism in a given situation. Um, Stability would be the expression of the fact that something is experienced by us as real. Um, and so this kind of brings me back to his exploration of anxiety in the last video, how that is decidedly the sense of instability, um, a lack of safety, and there is no real object that we're oriented to. So I think he's, he really contrasts um, this with when we perceive something as real, we perceive it very clearly that comes with a sense of stability. So these two things are very closely related. Um, it's not just that I perceive a thing out there as real, that the thing out there is what uh, alone determines that. How I perceive something is just as much about how does it relate to me and my nature? Um, do I experience stability and safety in my nature? That is what allows me um, to perceive something in a certain way. Um, but he also says it is stable because of its reality. Um, so this is one of those times that I don't fully grasp what he's saying, but I think it's a very thought-provoking quote. And yeah, I'm, I'll do what I can to kind of explain uh, how I see that connecting to other parts of, of his thought, um, even if I don't fully understand what he's saying here. Okay, <clears throat> so again, that, that quote was kind of an aside. It's not crucially important for the chapter, um, but if anyone wants to go off and study that more, if it's interesting to any folks out there, just wanted to include it. <clears throat> okay. The tendency toward the good gestalt finds its explanation as an organismic phenomenon. The explanation lies in the tendency toward preferred behavior, which is the essential prerequisite for the existence of a definite organism. It's really interesting that he asserts that um, the pre prerequisite for the existence for a defined organism is kind of defined through it having a tendency uh, to, it has preference, it has a pattern, and this pattern, this preference that we know in the, in the organism is what really defines it. It is its essence. So as I mentioned, he, he uses the word essential or essence uh, in this book. Um, he takes that kind of um, in a different direction than, uh, yeah, he uses that word that wasn't really used um, very much by the Gestaltists as far as I'm aware. That was kind of his own thing uh, to do that. Um, but he doesn't use it in a vitalistic way or in a way that is um, a dichotomy of body and soul. Uh, for him, essence is really just kind of this pattern of behavior. 
Um, as Merleau Ponty will put it, he talks about structure of behavior. Um, so it's not this kind of very, it's not a spiritual kind of, uh, concept and it's not a, a, an, it's not an extremely, um, as, when you think of like essentialism, uh, and you think of how sometimes people go in that direction, um, it's not exactly like that. It's just, um, how do we notice that there are certain common tendencies that we note across a species or across a lifespan of an individual that makes them have a certain personality? And that's really what he means by, um, in essence, a, a defining kind of quality of an organism. Anyway, I'll continue reading through these quotes. Uh, second one, he says, only through analysis of the interactional totality of the outer and inner field do the reasons become clear just why a certain pattern, a certain action appears as a good gestalt. On this basis, also the effects of such external and internal conditions as the constellation of the stimuli, personal factors as mental set, age, memory, type, and so on become intelligible all of which are factors determining the forming of good gestalton. So just to kind of summarize this quote, he's saying a difference that I have is I don't want to just ask what are laws that determine what makes a good and clear figure um, form and perception, which is a gestalt. He says, I know that this must also depend on the structure of the individual who perceives um, the, the good gestalt, this gestalt term is determined by uh, the personal traits of the human. Um, and that's what I just kind of explained here in my last bullet point. I say it's not just about the environment imposing on me, it is also about the inner field. The person who has a structure of their own, a self-organization of their own, uh, it's inner as well as outer conditions that determines good gestalt. He continues, one need merely realize that the best gestalt means the best for a coming to terms of organism and world, of adjustment in a definite situation, and that's a big term of Max Werthmer's, uh, that is to say, during a definite task. The task must be accomplished if a state of balance and gestalt are to arise at all. I mentioned this in my last video, but it's an interesting um, it's an interesting thing that the idea of self-actualization over time, I think, has this connotation of this kind of lifelong goal that by the end of your life, you will reach self-actualization, that it's some state to like arrive at. Um, and that's far from how Kurt Goldstein uses the term uh, in this book. He, he uses it as the idea that in a given situation, in a moment, how am I able to reach a, a state of kind of homeostasis? How am I able to um, meet my needs and uh, according to my nature, to uh, actualize my nature, but basically by completing the task that I need to complete, whether it's eating, whether it's finding joy, uh, <clears throat> whether it's going out to find food, <laughs> some, just some basic examples, but um, these are according to um, my nature, that I have this next step that I'm trying to reach. So it's always the next step. It's not this lifelong goal of becoming the, a self-actualized like guru. Um, it's, it's about a definite task, one followed after another. Um, and he says that it's, it's not simply about um, homeostasis of equalization uh, and of minimal energy ex exp expenditure. It's about those things, but that's in regard to the performance of a definite task. And again, the idea of a defined situation, of um, the actual or concrete situation, that's a huge term that comes from Max Werthermer, the founder of Gestalt Theory. Okay, so um, I'll just continue with this quote. He says, without reference to the organism, we simply cannot make any statement regarding the characteristics of gestalt. With my concept of the tendency to good gestalt as a tendency to the preferred and most suitable behavior of the whole organism in specific situations, I am therefore referring to the gestalt theorem because a far reaching agreement exists in our basic philosophy.
And again, he's talking about common ground here. He says, many a hypothesis and suggestion in Kafka's Principles of Gestalt Psychology and Werthmer's publications tend toward a conception of the principle of pra pregnancy. I don't even know how to say that in the more functional and more holistic sense of fitting together of the organism and the environment, uh, similar to my own endeavor. So he says that I have a lot of common ground with the Gestaltists, especially Kafka and Werthmer. Um, but that leads into this section where he does especially have some critiques and, and lays out some points of difference between him and the Gestaltists, especially on this topic of physical Gestalts. Um, this is a topic that I don't fully, uh, I can't fully wrap my head around all that he's saying here, and I don't fully understand what Kohler um, defines as a physical Gestalt. Um, I am very familiar with the talk that Max Werthmer gave on Gestalt theory and, uh, and, and as far as what he was talking about there uh, and how that can be compared to the topic of physical gestalts. Um, so I'll kind of read through these quotes and, and I'll be able to give you a bit of a kind of a nutshell summary of some of the key differences. Um, I think at least we can definitely talk about differences in focus, even though they have a lot in common, uh, just in their tendency to view a whole as more than the sum of its parts. Um, but uh, Goldstein is very much concerned with focusing on the organism as a whole. How is that different from other kinds of wholes? So that's kind of what, what he's talking about here. He says there is a very important distinction between those two kind of categories. And uh, it was Kohler who really uh, talked about physical Gestalten. So I'll read it. Um, we considered it necessary above to reject, oh, and, and this is kind of an aside um, before we get into the physical Gestalts. He says, we considered it necessary above to reject any parallelism between bodily and mental events and maintain that any such relation is conceivable only indirectly by reference to the whole of the organism. Um, that's an important point, but it's one that he's going to talk about again later in the chapter, so I'm going to set that aside for now. He's basically saying um, that bodily and mental events are truly just parts of one whole organism. They cannot be separated, um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so he says, Kohler attempted in his book concerning the physical gestalton to demonstrate the holistic character of physical processes. This offered the possibility of paralleling a holistic mental structure with a similar one in physical systems. The physical gestalt, according to Kohler, is just as little the sum of its parts as the melody is the sum of its notes. Physical gestalten are transposable just like mental gestalten, that is, they are independent of the size of the charge of the conductor as well as the size of the conductor itself. They merely depend on the form of the conductor, the topography. And in critique of that, he says, it was Dreisk who first called attention to the difficulties of comparison that lie in the factor of topography. In doing so, he pointed to the difference in nature between the physical gestalt and the organism. So this is Kurt Goldstein's point. Um, if we're not able, if you and me are not able to totally understand what he means and what I just read in the previous slide, um, just know that he's talking about difference in nature between the physical gestalt and the organism. Um, so something that's not an organism that does not function with the self-organization, self-regulation of an organism, um, insofar as that other kind of thing might be called a whole, um, that's what Kohler is kind of talking about. How can we define any other kind of whole? Um, he says, well, an organism in its nature is different than other kinds of wholes. That's really what he's um, saying generally here. And so he says the difference is the topography of the physical gestalten that is fundamental for them and depends on the external conditions. So that's the difference, is that, um, that I'll continue with the quote, for the topography of the organism, dependency cannot be shown. Um, so 
he's going to explain this more in uh, in a little bit uh, in what I read, but basically he says it's important to uh, pay attention to the fact that in an organism, um, it has its own kind of sustained tendencies. It's autonomous in a way, in a qualified way. He's not saying that um, myself as a person, a human person, does not rely on um, things from its environment to stay alive. For instance, I need food and, and these sorts of things. But I have a relative stability in me as self-regulation, self-organization. And he's basically saying uh, here, um, I'm pretty confident that this is really what he's saying, that there's a really important difference if we're talking about a whole person, they're not just determined by something outside of, of themselves. They have this fairly um, constant, using the term constants, uh, traits or uh, organization or structure. That's a word that's going to come up here and, and in the work of Merleau-Ponty. Um, there's an internal structure to the organism. Um, so that's kind of what he is saying here in this next point. I'll read it. The topography of the organism is relatively autonomous, a given fact. Within certain limits, the organism can remain intact by virtue of its own nature, in spite of great differences in environment. It selects autonomously, so to speak, the milieu that is adequate to it within the world. No matter how much the processes within the organism are co-determined by the environment, they would be utterly intelligible if considered from the environment alone. So I am also co-determined by my environment, but I would be unintelligible if I was just considered from my environment. There's more to me than just what happens out there. Um, there are parts of me that make me me, um, not just determined by environment. All right, he, uh, this is the first point of seven numbered points that he uh, summarizes at the end of this chapter, the key points of difference between him, his thought, and the thought of the Gestalt theorists. Um, okay, so this, this is the whole of point one. So I just typed the whole thing out. Um, he says, the notion of physical Gestalt refers to states of dynamic equilibrium. In our organismic concept, we have developed the idea of equalization toward a level adequate to the organism's functional self-actualization. Only this equalization concept makes intelligible the fact that a certain state of tension can represent a state of equilibrium. Um, I'm not fully able, I, I, this is another one of the points where I would love to hear him expand on this a bit. and. Sometimes with Goldstein, he'll say something very deep, but he will not say much. And so this is really, I, I think, one of the times where you know, that's all he says. Um, and he, he leaves it to you to really unpack it. Um, and, and maybe others will be able to say more about this um, if they work more on uh, publishing on this topic. But he's big on the idea that equilibrium, which is a really big term for the gestaltists, it doesn't exist in real life. We never reach it. So I think here he's kind of saying, if we talk about the idea of equalization instead, um, which is functionally kind of, um, this, okay, in practice, I'm able to self-actualize. I'm able to kind of generally experience stability and safety. Things are not perfect. I'm not reaching homeostasis all the time, but I'm able to meet my needs step by step by step. Each each action, I'm able to complete it. Um, th that is what he wants to talk about rather than just the concept of, of equilibrium. So he says a state of tension can represent a state of equilibrium, even uh, when there is this tension, um, as long as we're able to self-actualize uh, from moment to moment, um, that can represent basically uh, a state of equ equilibrium. At the end of this um, chapter, he's going to say points one through four, I have a lot of common ground with the Gestaltists and we could overcome our differences pretty easily and, and I'll get to that. Um, but yeah, so points one and four of this list, he says, um, I can see how we can bridge our, our differences. So Again, he has a lot of common ground with them, and he seems to just kind of want to tweak their terminology a bit. 
All right, so point number two. He says, the individual field forces, including vectors, for example, cannot be def defined merely in terms of the field itself. Um, so I'll just kind of explain a bit. This is where he's talking again about topography. I, I'm not confident that I can offer you a really good definition of what he means by topography, but this was the area that Kurt Lewin uh, really contributed to. And Kurt Lewin was really big on field forces and, and what he's going to talk about here um, for those who are familiar with that name um, in the Gestalt tradition. <clears throat> um, and so that's just, just a note. I wanted to mention that. <clears throat> for those who want to look into more understanding what he's talking about here, for those who are familiar with him, um, <clears throat> he, he continues... As Kohler also emphasizes, these forces can only become understandable by their embeddedness in the whole, but this whole cannot be taken simply as another and more complicated field. One has to realize that it varies constantly according to the varying situations. Reducing the entire situation to field forces would therefore imply the ne necessity of introducing new variables again and again. Uh, so he's saying here the field is constantly changing. There must be more to consider than just this flux of constantly changing um, conditions in the field. He says, since the functional significance of these variables depends on the respective task, in reference to the potentialities of self-actualization, we are referred back to the organism as chief determiner of the field forces. Uh, I think that to kind of understand this point, he's just kind of summarizing something that he talked about a few pages before, about how we need to pay attention to the field of the organism and not just the field out there as if the organism is just like responding in an automatic um, normed way that as if everyone would respond the same way to a given environment. He says, no, we, the chief determiner uh, actually is the organism. Okay, so number three, the functional significance of field forces, valences, even of preferred gestalts and constants cannot be determined in a physicalist causal sense of objectivity. Determination is only possible from the specific organization of the organism that can be inferred only from its forms of coming to terms with stimuli. And this is such a short point that he does not talk a lot about. That's that's all he says for point three. Um, and I think that this point three and point four might be parts of this work that Merleau-Ponty especially paid attention to uh, and agreed with that uh, inspired in part at least his book, The Structure of Behavior. Because this is what Merleau-Ponty also says of the Gestaltists, that there's something about their view um, that is too physicalist or too objectivist. Um, and so this is something that I'm hoping maybe since Goldstein does not talk a lot about what he means here, uh, I'm hoping that Merleau-Ponty's book, The Structure of Behavior, is going to help help us understand a little bit more of uh, what is the, the cause for this critique. Um, yeah, he says determination is only possible from the specific organization of the organism that can be inferred only from its forms of coming to terms with stimuli. Um, the best I could do basically is I think this is just kind of reiterating the same point that it's not just uh, a set of causes that are external to the organism, but there can be um, individual traits of an organism that it has a nature that we need to pay attention to. Um, and so I look forward to talking a lot more on this point. So if this is uh, something that you're, you're wanting to know more about, please check out my videos on the structure of behavior by Merleau-Ponty. We're going to be talking a lot about um, this question of physicalism and objectivism versus subjectivism and essence and nature um, and organism having structure. Uh, these are going to be really key terms that come up and are at the heart of Merleau-Ponty's book, The Structure of Behavior. Um, and he, it's going to continue with point four here. <clears throat> okay, so point four. From this interrelatedness of functional significance in specific organization and structure, it follows that the constants, good gestalt and so on, 
are not necessarily identical in the various species, nor even in different human individuals. So again, this is the point that an individual might have a nature that is different than the next individual, even within the same species. Um, okay. Wherever similarities are found, they point to similarities of structural organization. The statement does not in any way advocate an interpretation as to mere arbitrariness and meaninglessness within the relation of organismic beings in their respective milieus. Our emphasis on the specific organization as ba basic for functional significance merely shifts the aspect of non-arbitrary, non-mechanical patterns from laws of the physical field to the above mentioned interrelatedness. So one thing that I think I can confidently say that he's saying here is we're shifting our focus from laws of the external environmental physical field um, to something else. Um, and that he's paying attention here to differences between person to person. And again, he uses the term structure. That's gonna be a very, very important word in Merleau-Ponty's book, The Structure of Behavior. And again, Merleau-Ponty himself has said that Kurt Goldstein is very important um, in, in his uh, formation of his, his ideas. Okay, point five. Uh, with the principle of isomorphism, one tries to establish a direct parallelism or correspondence between physical gestalt processes and the mental configurations. Viewed from our organismic conception, this is inadequate. Every part event, be it physical, be it mental, refers to the whole, and only by way of the whole is it related to the other event, be it physical or mental. The whole of the organism therefore supports all partitive phenomena of either aspect, which are nothing but different expressions of that unitary meaningfulness. Here he's just really um, saying he takes the unity of the organism seriously. It's not just a conjoined body and mind, he says they just exist in as much as this one thing exists. There is a unity um, only by way of the whole um, does it kind of exist. Um, so he says we really cannot um, separate these two things. All right, let's see here. Okay, here he's talking about what makes humans um, more advanced beings. This is also a very big topic that we're going to see Merleau-Ponty takes up. Um, he talks about choices, making connections, taking things apart. Um, so I'll just read the whole quote. The claims of isomorphic and invariably non-arbitrary gestalt patterns does not leave sufficient room for a positive determination and explanation of a phenomenon that is in particular an attribute of the human being. We have called it abstract behavior, embodying in this notion the ability of voluntary shifting, kind of willing, uh, conscious decision-making, uh, of reasoning discursively, oriented on self-chosen frames of reference, of free decision for action, of isolating parts from a whole, of disjoining given wholes, as well as of establishing connections, for example, in learning. How far these phenomena may reach into lower organized beings, we are unable to tell. However, human behavior will never become understandable in its specific complexity if one does not realize that the very organization of the human being consists in the potentiality to behave partitively as well as holistically. Um, so I think this seems very important. I'm not completely, um, sure of all that he's saying here. Um, but I think that he's saying that there are aspects of Gestalt theory that do not adequately describe, uh, the human experience. It does not adequately, um, give us the understanding of these very human aspects of, of will and consciousness and, learning and making connections and separating things. Um, he says there's something that we have not paid adequate attention to um, in these very human um, parts of life. Uh, and I would agree with that critique. I love Gestalt theory, but um, I think they found themselves lost in trying to determine these laws that apply across the board um, in a very objectivist way. Uh, and he... Um, 
Goldstein is saying that there are um, very personal parts of, of experience of life for humans where we, we make choices and we have consciousness and we have personality and these very kind of individual qualities. We have um, a nature uh, that is greater than just um, the impact of an environment on myself. So that's, that's what he's saying there. Um, so then point seven is this. He just kind of says the comments in points one through four do not offer insurmountable discrepancies between the Gestalt theory and my own theory. In my concept of the configurational process in the organism, the figure, in the sense of Gestalt, already represents a partitive phenomenon. So in, in the, a couple of points ago, um, maybe in the last point, he said when he's talking about what makes us human, and what sets us apart um, as more developed uh, beings, more advanced beings. Um, he talks about how we are able to um, not only make connections, but also to um, separate things uh, and to uh, have partitive phenomenon. Uh, I'm not able to completely um, describe what all that means. Uh, I would love it if he gave us a bit more uh, description of that, but that's what he's talking about here. He says that Gestalt has this sense of a figure arising um, amongst a whole, but it's something that stands out apart from the rest of the whole. Um, and so he says that is a very similar concept to what I want to talk about. I see overlap there. Uh, he says, if the scope of holistic events were enlarged to include the entire organism, then the Gestalt principle would become sufficiently broad to fit all the facts that may not have as yet been covered. So there, there is of overlap and in the influence of Gestalt on Kurt Goldstein's whole uh, philosophy is incredibly important. Um, so the last part of this chapter is titled The Problem of Parts and Whole, and I won't go into all of it. I won't go into the very last couple of pages, <clears throat> but he says this. He, he asks, uh, he says, one might ask, why do we stop at the organism as a delimited whole? Is not the organism also only a part of a greater whole, uh, a part of a greater in entirety? One certainly would have to answer this in the affirmative. So he says, I agree. <clears throat> that is something that uh, it, it's like different kind of focuses. He has this focus on we need to look at the organism as a whole. And there's always more you can say. You can say, well, there's a greater whole than that. With any whole, you can point and say, well, it only functions in light of this even greater whole, in, in light of this environment in which it is. Um, and so he says, yes, you know, that's that's a very valid point. The Gestaltists are right to um, include the environment as, as an important part of things. Um, it, it does form a greater whole, uh, the organism plus environment. Um, but... Regardless, Kurt Goldstein wants to, um, the figure uh, in his perception is the, the organism. So he says, I want to focus on that, even though there is a greater whole, there is a ground outside of this, this organism. Um, okay, and so uh, he continues and he, he just kind of continues with this agreement of, of this point. And it's a very significant caveat to his work that he does take, um, take into account. He acknowledges it. He says, in our cognitive procedure, we halt with the individual as a preliminary whole, simply because we here arrive factually at a relatively satisfactory result, or at least at a much better result than if we started in the customary manner from the parts. In the first video in this series, I talked about how he says um, we would do better to start with a whole because a whole determines its parts. We can't just stack up and build a whole by building parts plus parts plus parts. Um, to understand a human person as an organism, we need to view them as one whole and not just a sum of systems. Um, um, but this is a very significant part of his book where he, he is honest um, in saying um, it's not absolute. There, there's no absolute separation of an organism from its environment. Okay, and, and so that also in this section, he says, what about the question of the being alive of the parts? 
this is a just kind of a philosophical question and I think it's a really cool one that he does not go into many words on it but I think it's very thought-provoking um, he says what about the question of the being alive of the parts this is certainly a difficult and very serious question one could assert that the parts are alive and also that they are not alive they are alive only insofar as they are supported externally or from the whole. And it's just such few words, but a really, um, really important question, just philosophical question. To what extent, when you're talking about a human being, can you talk about one's parts being alive, such as um, an organ in your body? We talked about this before. To what extent can we isolate a heart as its own thing when its very ability to really be a heart, uh, to be alive as a, a heart, uh, it depends on the rest of the whole. Um, so it's just this interesting question. Um, he continues, and I won't get into what he continues with, um, but he does say at some point that he does not agree with the vitalists on something. Um, so I think that it's very important to note that he um, he retains much common ground with the Gestaltists, and, and so far as he shares much of their maybe so-called materialist viewpoint of things, even though he has his own uh, different kind of set of things he wants to focus on, things that he, he says they have neglected about the human person, and, uh, and he does use kind of the word essence and nature. Um, but at the same time, nowhere in this book thus far that I have read has he sided with um, vitalist thought in the way that many vitalists had critiqued the Gestalt theorists. So I do also want to highlight that common ground as well that he shares with the Gestaltists. And look forward to doing the last part of the series next time. Thanks.